in order to contribute to national development. The Act changed in 2018. The new element is that contribution to national development together with science engagement and um, the maintenance of the national system of innovation. And all these areas that I've mentioned are interrelated. People, they work on research, they produce uh, knowledge, uh, technologies, innovation, and um, the research projects, they are enabled by infrastructure, and we can't work without the engaged research because society has to be part of that if we have to be effective in national development. Uh, our human capacity development, uh, we are going to have uh, two presentations. It's the same presentation. We'll start with human capacity development and then we'll follow with the relationship between science and society, which will be done by Dr. Damons. So on the um, human capacity development uh, side, we have a pipeline as the uh, National Research Foundation where we look at the postgraduate um, students as an initial stage of that researcher pipeline. And uh, their contribution to national development is twofold. If they graduate and they get to work within the research uh, space, they contribute towards research. Otherwise, they contribute towards um, the um, South Africa's economy and other facets of our economy. So we, we, we support postgraduate students in numerous ways, mainly bursary scholarships, but they have to work on research projects at postgraduate level. So how we find the researchers in research projects is quite critical for the students to be able to work on those projects. And at the same time, we enable students to have access to infrastructure locally, internationally, and um, they participate in conferences at times, and sometimes we expose them to innovation-rich um, areas. Um, this slide is to highlight the discrepancy between the provision of our government for undergraduate students versus uh, the postgraduate students. Through the NSFAS, the undergraduate students are funded uh, to the tune of about 18 billion rand combined with the TVET colleges. Whereas when you look at the postgraduate level, we are looking at less than a billion which is being invested through the National Research Foundation. And that is going to come back to bite us if we don't make sure that we have a balance in terms of the uh, way in which we fund postgraduate students. Because the first students who benefited from um, the fee-free higher education are going to come back at postgraduate level and want to proceed with their studies having performed well. Uh, the pipeline that we look at at postgraduate level is honors, masters, uh, PhD. And um, what you will note is that at honors level, we have the kind of representation that we require, both blacks and both women. And uh, come masters, the representation of women, it starts to decline. For blacks, women Africans, women colored, women Indians altogether, that starts to decline at master's level. By the time we hit the doctoral level, uh, then we have reached um, uh, women and blacks with very relatively low representation. And there's a reason for that. We did some study on that. And what we found was that the reason is just funding. Most of the black students at honors level cannot be translated up to doctoral level due to, to the kind of support that we provide, which is not adequate for people, for uh, doctoral studies to be attractive, for particularly for the local black uh, students. Uh, this slide is to demonstrate the kind of demand that is there for research grants and postgraduate students. Um, we are interested more in the postgraduate student uh, funding. And what we note is that 
at the end of it, we are only able to support a fraction of the demand that we have within the system. Looking at the next stage of development of the researchers, which are the early career researchers, um, these are people who are within academic or research institution, and they are in a developmental track. They are not established yet as researchers, and um, they require a developmental um, support from both the funders and the institutions which host them. And we do support them in a number of ways, research funding, infrastructure, and we also fund the students which, are, which they supervise. These are some of the examples of the early career researchers, postdoctoral fellows, uh, black academic advancement program, uh, wire-rated researchers, which are young researchers, Tutuka program, which is um, an um, equity development program or redress, focused largely on redress. The Tutuka is a partnership program uh, between the National Research Foundation and host institutions. Those host institutions are, are universities where the NRF funds about two thirds, the university about a third. It's managed at the level of deputy vice chancellor for research. And these are young, largely black academics and women who need um, to develop their research career. And to the level of being established. So we have uh, support for them while they are busy with their PhDs. This is how we partner with the Department of Higher Education and Training as well through their um, uh, NGAP program for those students who are at PhD track. We support those students um, through funding from the NRF side and they get into the PhD or post PhD track depending on where they are. So this is a very strong partnership with, that we have with the Department of Higher Education and Training. And then there are those who do the, uh, um, the rating track. The maximum that a person can be on this program is nine years. Uh, these are the, um, the data on representation by women and also by blacks, which is quite impressive on the Tutuka program. 64% uh, women and 84% uh, uh, blacks. These are the inv investments that we have made over time on this program, which is the Tutuka program. Uh, they have been increasing, although at a very slow pace, considering the demand of the program. Then we have another program, which is also for early career researchers, which is advancing also equity for black academic advancement program. This is in partnership with the First Rand Foundation. And the key focus of this program is to fast track the development of black researchers. Uh, it can be held at a university. Also, it is held in the science councils. So for those researchers who want to complete their PhDs, they are able to get a lecturer replacement support for completing the PhD, but at the quickest possible time. So it's not that kind of a program where you ask for two months to do this, or it requires you to go for a year or go for six months and be clear that you're going to be finishing when you get back. And similarly, at the post PhD level, the intention of this program is for you to develop as a researcher in the quickest possible time. We partner with First Rand in it. We've supported more than 100 um, academics already and researchers uh, in 2020, um, which is this financial year, uh, about 90 academics were supposed to be supported. Uh, these are some of the people who have benefited and uh, eventually got their PhD qualification through the program. And then we move on to the established researchers. These are the major producers of knowledge and the knowledge outputs in our system. 
and um, they are the mentors for researchers who are early career researchers and at the same time they are the main supervisors of our masters and doctoral students um, we support them uh, in the very same way that we support our early career researchers the only difference is that also we may provide funding for mentoring of early career researchers uh, to these uh, researchers uh, we do have a number of uh, programs for the established researchers the, the blue skies it's for fundamental research competitive program it's competitive for those uh, researchers who are rated and the incentive funding for rating uh, that is for rated researchers um, but right now the amount of money involved in that program considering the number of researchers is not that significant at all um, so when we link uh, the rating system with um, funding this is what is happening here this is an instrument which was established in 1984 and the researchers they uh, voluntarily apply to be assessed uh, in terms of their scientific standing and their productivity, their impact, and their contribution to national development. And so they do get this assessment, and in the end, the results come, uh, rating them according to the categories which range from A, B, C, P, Y, where A is um, the, these are the leading researchers which are internationally competitive and then the Y one is for young researchers who are aspiring to be established so the number of people who have requested rating has been increasing exponentially within the system and then we have our uh, programs where we invest a lot of money the South African Research Chairs Initiative which provides two categories of chairs the tier one chairs getting about 2.5 million per year for funding for research uh, salaries together with uh, students to be supported and the tier two uh, about 1.5 more um, development or established right enough however not at the top in terms of being um, a world uh, class so um, we have the centers of excellence about 15 of them and that program is looking at identifying areas where South Africa excels uh, in research and putting together all those uh, areas. There is a host institution that notes to it. The science mission, the priorities largely of government in the previous uh, strategies that we have had. So the South African Research uh, Chairs Initiative I've mentioned established in 2005 we store six we are investing about 566 million uh, in 2019 and it has in the same year managed to leverage more than four times that amount that we've leveraged two billion rand that is the advantage of having these research shares in centers of excellence is that they leverage a whole lot more than what we give them uh, from the system. The areas uh, of the chairs, uh, you can see there we have science and uh, engineering and technology. We have social sciences, about a third. Uh, coming from there, we have uh, business um, and commerce. In the science, engineering, and technology, you will find out that the representation of these chairs particularly for blacks and and uh, for women in particular is that is relatively low when you look at social sciences women are nicely represented 
and in business women are nicely represented so the uh, engagement at low levels particularly for girl children becomes quite an important areas so as to access science engineering and technology fields and dr damons will be talking about that at a later stage uh, when we look at the chairs the students together with the postdocs fellows which are mentored by the chairs you will find out that when it comes to representation they um perform better than the students that we support broadly. For instance, for doctoral students, we are looking at 73% representation by blacks, whereas in our doctoral students, they were talking about 50-something uh, percent, which was quite low. And similarly, at master's level, we are looking at 76%, we are talking about 67% there. So, in as much as the representation of chairs uh, when it comes to race and gender is not that impressive, the students that they supervise uh, have got relatively good representation. This is just one example where the chairs and the centers of excellence are contributing towards national development with a priority of health in, in this particular case, which we know is an important aspect of our national development and is one of the priorities highlighted now in our five-year implementation plan of the um, of the national development plan. We have three centers of excellence in health. We've got TB, we have SASEMA, which is disease modeling or epidemiological modeling of diseases. We have HIV and the contribution that these chairs have made in terms of the knowledge, in terms of the technologies is just immeasurable. Uh, we looking at the human capacity which exists and which is being developed at these chairs. We're looking at those students, 758 students uh, over a five-year period, uh, 49 researchers which have been working on that. And those are the investments that we have made similarly with the research chairs in health professions and related areas. Uh, five in uh, HIV AIDS. So these are the areas that we invest heavily in as a system and the results of uh, that shows in the system. This is a summary of the impact of the South African research chairs and uh, centers of excellence over the past five years. We we'll look at the first block, just the last point or the last bullet there. Whereas we have invested about uh, 3.5 billion rand in the chairs, um, what they've managed to leverage is almost double that at 7 billion rand if you look at that last bullet. So those are the researchers leveraging using the funds that we are, use, we are, are giving them. And um, looking at the research outputs that we have there in the second uh, uh, block, and in the third block, we're looking at a number of outcomes, including the knowledge advancement, um, the policy change in sugar tax, land reform, public health approach uh, uh, to effective HIV, self-testing, and HIV in young women in Africa. Um, so there are a lot of outcomes. Just, just the drafting of the National Development Plan, it has had a lot of contribution from the researchers who are within the CHAIRS program. And the impact broadly of uh, the CHAIRS is uh, together with centers of excellence. If we look at just one center of excellence together with uh, the chairs working in tree health um, research, they have managed to save the country from um, or the economy with a, a value of about 1.2 billion when it comes to tree health. We know that 
forestry is one of the areas that are very strong in, particularly if you look at uh, KZN, you look at um, areas such as uh, the Garden Belt and so on. Looking at the humanities and social sciences, these are some of the contributions that we're making. This total amount of 474 million rand is um, our total investment in humanities, social sciences, economics, law, arts. That was in 2018. As I mentioned, about a third of the chairs are within the social sciences and humanities. We do advance human capital development uh, through partnership together with improving excellence. And um, I'll mention a number of examples. We, I mentioned the partnership with First Rand, for instance, in the Black Advancement, Academics Advancement Program. The First Rand funds four research chairs in maths education. Uh, we partner with them in that. NetBank, we, uh, they fund three research chairs. One is in energy, the two are in uh, health sciences. Sugar milling, uh, it funds a chair. SAS, NRF Sasol, uh, we fund postgraduate students. Uh, those are some of the examples uh, that we have. On the National Skills uh, uh, Fund, uh, we've been working together with them to identify the scarce skills in the country and have supported the NRF um, over time. Um, starting in 2018, that was not their beginning, though, 2018. We've partnered with them before. I'm just to 151 million and 145 million due to the pressures which um, they have had over the years. And the excellence is so crucial for us, particularly at the student development level together with the pool, uh, uh, early career researcher level. So what we've managed to do is to um, negotiate with the international partners so that they can be able to place our students and our early career researchers in um, their sites, researcher sites, and for provision of infrastructure. Those are some of the examples that I've highlighted in that slide, and we do advance Sorry. We do advance uh, the Africa Agenda um, um, 2063 together with STISA. We work with about uh, 15 countries in the Sub-Saharan re uh, region, two in West Africa. Uh, in development, we've been working with them since 2014. So together now with international funders, we have established the 10 OR Tambo chairs which are placed at seven African countries. And that's the, those are the funds that we are contributing towards and we have managed to leverage. And Dr. Damons will be speaking about a similar initiative as well on COVID-19 pertaining to the African countries. Um, I'm not sure if I still have time or not because Dr. Damons will need about 15 minutes. I just need to highlight that we've got other programs where we leverage on the innovation um, sites like the professional development program where we place our researchers in um, uh, innovation rich environments. Um, I have to remove this share first. Am I sharing or am I not? Sorry. Uh, Dr. Damons, do you have uh, control of the share button or not? Uh, not uh, I'm trying, I'm trying. Oh, okay. Let me. Is that you? 
Is that you? Can I? Okay. You can unshare. Pardon? Have you unshared? I thought I did, but I'm not sure what's happening. Okay, we can see this. Let me. Uh, colleagues, can I mute myself and just get off the screen? Hitiwe, you just have to move the slides quickly, please. <coughs> Good afternoon, colleagues. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you. Proceed. Thank you. Can you see the slides? Yeah, we can see your slides. Thank you. Uh, I'm just looking at a slide now that says uh, what we are going to do is Dr. Matuta took you through the aspect of knowledge generation and the people aspects of it. And what I'm going to look at is to continue to see the relationship between the knowledge and the society in which uh, we uh, operate. If we find on this particular slide, if you have a look, you will see and recognize very quickly strong geographic areas that this country has chosen to advance its knowledge agenda. That being astronomy, you can see the southern skies. You can see um, the contributions through our expertise uh, in the discovery of gravitational waves in 2018. You can see this interpretation into Aboriginal and Indigenous art. Uh, the science interpretation into art. You can see the focus on our origins through paleontology. All of these are representatives of the strength of the research of our country, which you've also had a chance to uh, gain from the, the information that Dr. Matutu has uh, provided. But what we want to, what I want to emphasize in this part of the presentation, that the strength of that research has to continue in conversation with the community. We must strengthen our research with conversations about science that count. And if you look at those two inserts that I've placed there around the most recent example of the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic, where we find that science and science communication has come to its fore when the scientists have been in conversation with the community, with the broader public audiences. And the first one, we have education researchers guiding decisions around um, outcomes in education, and a philosopher talking around COVID and looking at what it is that both of them are going into that. So what we find is that we are really having a situation where our I'm sorry, I seem to have lost the slides. Are you winning? Uh, the I'm slide? sorry. Yeah, I, I can see it. Can you see it? Because I just see a black space on mine. <laughs> Okay, we still can't see the slides. I'm sorry about that. Okay, Shalas, can you help with the slides? Do you have a copy of the slides? Uh, Shanas? I'll check now, Tui. Okay, Tui, if you can check, sorry. Uh, something was coming on the screen, but uh, 
Let me see if I can manage from my side. Um, can, can, can I move down? Okay. Oh, sorry, Beth. I just don't see the screen at all. I'm sorry. Oh, you can't see it. Mm. Let me see. Did I? I thought I shared. Yeah, we can see it, by the way. So if that helps. We can, we can see it. So uh, at the, with the slide with home and a lady is that fine yeah, with you Beth? yeah you carry on carry on just carry on move to the next one sorry important. so i'm going to very very quickly start off with the importance i think definition is important because when we speak of science engagement there are many uh, various understandings some people are thinking of community engagement others are, are thinking of volunteerism for example but here i want to just stress the first thing is this engagement that we are talking about with science is intentional and meaningful engagement between the scientists and the science and the public this is not about marketing this is not marketing campaigns this is not about advocacy when we speak about the engagement with science we talk about deliberate interactions of mutual learning between science and its various publics, whether it's through co-design or co-production, and all of the public funding agencies of science to be acting as mediators of the tensions because the relationship between science and its many publics cannot always be assumed to be a unilateral one and that it does have tensions that need to be mediated. Thank you, Petiwe. What we do find in the next slide is that I've just highlighted in the development of the Knowledge Society, NRF aims to enhance this engagement between science and society. Our relationship as a country between the public and science is one from our past which has been infused with very much distance. We've come from a past which has excluded uh, based on science such as in defense and nuclear. We had a, a, a period where there were boycotts of the science and the international science. And so we have a lot to do to enhance the engagement, the openness, the transparency of relationship between science and society to inform and build critical and socially aware citizenry. We've seen that come to the fore now in COVID very much a, a, an informed, critical, and socially awake citizenry. We see that around broader issues of climate change, much anti-science coming up. So we really need to pay attention to how we enhance this relationship between science and society, how our scholarship becomes much more engaged with the various communities out there so that our research and our engagement is one of our in pathways to the impact of the research agenda out there. This slide very quickly just gives you an overview of the NRF current engagement context. And all I want to uh, emphasize here is that it's a holistic approach. It's informed by um, legislation policy, both the white paper on science, technology, and innovation, uh, and a science engagement framework put out in 2015 by the Departments of Science and Innovation. And then the rest of the information would say to you that the work that we do is done across both our research funding part of the organization, um, SASTA, and also our national facilities, a holistic approach to science engage engagement. The next slide shows you how we've, over the years, um, formed this approach. You will see it's been formed around science education, science awareness, and science communication, definitely based on our context of history of science and also our gaps within our science education system. And mostly, as you would see, in science engineering and technology. That has been the emphasis given, especially in education and in our skills development, the gaps that we find. In this, I'm just going to use two examples, and there's much more work that is done that shows you an emphasis on areas of education, given that this is the science education being the pipeline, and then also in communication as part of engaged research. The next slide then you would see uh, takes us to show you, give you a sense of how the research and the researchers are working with the learner community. But I want to point out at this stage that we must remember that the Department of Basic Education is the custodian and has juris jurisdiction over the education, the teachers and the learning. What the work of the NRF through the support of the Department of Science and Innovation does is it supplements 
the learning in the classroom with other uh, interventions to assist um, how we work, how we grow uh, capacity in science, uh, technology, uh, uh, and uh, innovation. This is an example where we show that an ex uh, we identify and nurture early talent through uh, Olympiads and competitions, which are there to uh, focus on increasing skills development, increase content knowledge but also supported through workshops and career guidance. The next slide will give you a sense of the fact that these interventions, so for example, Olympiads and uh, competitions, help us to identify talent very early in the young. Sometimes we feel that the learners are left to themselves and really talented individuals just pass through the cracks if they are not identified early and nurtured through the system so that they can reach their full potential to help also to support participation and improve performance in maths and science and then also to expose them to a variety of STEM related career, uh, career guidance uh, and that uh, is very important. So as you see, if we have a look at the next slide, we do see there that this engagement with learners, the reach has been throughout all uh, 52 district municipalities that have been reached. Um, I want, if you look at the numbers, I know that somebody sitting there might be saying, well, we have 25,000 schools and reaching almost 12 million learners. And how do these numbers line up? We must remember that we are supporting. We are supporting and this numbers would be for one year only. And this is in support of uh, classroom learning. How do we identify talent? How do we improve performance? How do we um, uh, support um, careers into science? If you look at the next slide, you will then see that it just gives you a flavor. It's not so much for you to uh, concentration of, uh, concentrate on the names, but to see that excellence, because really Olympiads try to um, promote excellence in science, and what you would see that this, the excellence is across the different types of schools that we have in the schooling system. And those of you who know, you see, uh, those of you who know from science and technology in Bilwe, uh, high school in Lipopo comes up time and time again for the, the, just in these three years. Uh, and that's a public school in which is competing quite amiably and affably with other uh, schools to produce uh, really talented learners in math, science and uh, technology. You would see as we identify this talent, uh, the winner of the, the uh, Hamitia Mative uh, was from Mbilwe High School. Uh, there are other examples of all of these winners which have gone on really to be high achievers. Top of the list there would be Professor Chalitsi Marwala, who everybody would know uh, from the DVC of UJ. And uh, you would also see that he uh, won the Olympiad in 1989. And in his story, he said it was one of the turning points in his thoughts about his future uh, in in science, as it were. So we think that these these interventions really do nurture and support. If we are, can identify talent, provide the support, um, supplementary support, that they can go on to make a difference in our talent pool around the country. The next slide shows just the points I want to make here is that these interventions, even though the, the numbers may be smaller, we are finding that the interventions, if carried consistently over a longer period of time, will lead to choices in uh, further education. You would see the over 70% of children, of learners who le left the school that participated in these are actually making decisions to go to university, University of Technology, and then obviously lessers to TVET colleges. With the number of females um, really dominating in these areas, and this is what we've always been uh, talking to the gender uh, female represented representation, especially in the SET uh, uh, sector. Our high-end uh, centers of excellence that you have heard about uh, through Dr. Matutu, they also, not only are they having high levels of postgraduate students and researchers, but they through their, their requirements of their funding, 
do have to provide back into the systems and support education in various ways. This is the Center of Excellence in Invasion Biology at the University of Stellenbosch. And this is an, just an example of how these various centers, this is one center, but most of them are extending the knowledge of the learner community from what you learn in the formal classroom, take it out into real life, into research. You would see the center of excellence in uh, catalysis, um, also making sure that they support uh, science uh, learning, science classroom learning, which we know is problematic still in many schools and that teachers need support through that. And then the center of excellence in uh, the next one in biomedical uh, research, TB research, doing similar things, but taking it a step further to ensure that the learners gain insights into what is a career in research entails. I wonder if many of us sitting around the table had had an opportunity at that time, maybe I'm speaking from my age, but if you had had an opportunity of that time to get into a lab and really see and understand what research entails or speak to a scientist, whether they were uh, uh, archaeologists or anthropologists, to understand what does this thing called research entail. And these are the kind of opportunities that we are trying to provide. We are looking also at the National Youth Services Program, which is a program for unemployed SET graduates, trying to take unemployed SET graduates and provide them with experience from these graduates that the numbers that are here are working mostly in science engagement like areas like uh, science centers, museums, etc., and helping them to gain, uh, to gain experience and become more employable. The next program is a similar program, but what this one is very specific to doing, this is taking the youth 18, between 18 and 35 with undergraduate qualifications and exposing them to journalism skills, but very especially training in community media so that you enhance science coverage in indigenous languages. Now we know the issue okay. of um, okay. language and science and we're going to find that this has Can I been. Interrupt you, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, if we can move towards uh, wrapping up. Uh... Yes, I will. Thank you. Right, I'm, I'm. I'm just using my last two minutes. You will see that they have been able to uh, produce uh, over two and a half thousand stories in eleven different official languages. So this is the community media, and you would see who these youth actually are in the journalism program in the next slide and then if we go to ahead the next slide as well you would see that the next slide gives you a sense of just the language spread and community media the number of set uh, articles increasing as well as general science stories uh, last couple of slides speak to research, COVID research in the media, just to show you how science communication has come into its own, how the researchers of the South African research community have been engaging with the communities, with the public, both nationally and internationally, and how we've had to respond, given that this work cannot actually get to, um, have to actually get now to the public that we ordinarily reach on a face-to-face -face basis, you see it's gone online and it's also trying to still reach through going to the people, for example, mobile laboratories. I think uh, the, a great opportunity that exists and shows us the relationship, how we con must continue to see the relationship between the science and the societies in which the science is undertaken or on which the science is undertaken. Um, currently, there's a call out on the Africa Rapid Grant Fund, which funds both the research, but engagement research around science and health journalists and communicators, and also science advisors. And also coming up in uh, May 2021, an international meeting around mission-oriented research. That's research that is driving much of the technology developments and solutions that we need from national development, but also looking at its engagement with the publics in which it's located. So this part, this part of our mandate, the engagement part of our mandate, continues to say that as we support our research, we need to ensure that this research continues to build relationships with society. 
I will end off on this slide just to highlight some of the challenges that are faced by the um, by the issues raised both through Dr. Matutu's part and the science engagement part. Three areas mostly. The need for increased public investment, as you would understand, uh, it's, a it's a challenge facing the system. The need for policy and planning coherence, given that as NRF, we respond both to DHET mandate and a DSI mandate. And then the, the issue of system-wide transformation being an interrelated and inter interdependent uh, uh, challenge for us all with NRF as one of the players in that particular challenge. Thank you very much, Chair and members of the committee. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. <clears throat> it was a little bit long, uh, but uh, it was generally a very good presentation. Uh, can we then move to the next one, and then after which we will then take all of them at once? Um, uh, I, that is the, the um, National Institute for Social Sciences and Humanities. Okay, yeah. Um, can we take the National Institute? Uh, you have about. Uh, uh, until at least two o'clock. After Thanks, which we will to members, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Chair, this is uh, Sarah Musweza, the CEO of the NIHSS. The chairperson of the board is linked in. I was wondering if. Ari, you can start. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Members can you hear me? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Professor Seatons. I'm the chair of the of the board. Today with us, we also brought Mr. Molako of Molako Industries, who's the chair of the subcommittee on human resources. Professor Nkland from Kise, who is um, deputy vice chancellor at UKZN and responsible for humanities there. He is the chair of the subcommittee on academic affairs in the Institute. Of course, we have Professor Mosuetsa, the CEO, who will be the heart of the presentations uh, today. And then also in attendance is the C CFO, uh, Tumelo Mokwena, just in case any questions uh, arise. On my, on my part, as chair of the board, I only have three little sound bites. The first one is that we're working actively at the moment in getting our fourth clean audit. We're in the middle of it. It's very difficult under COVID conditions, but we are working and we're very proud to be moving towards a fourth clean one. The second one is that we've reached five years in our uh, existence. And as the statute demands, the minister has appointed a review committee, which is busy uh, as we speak. And the third one is that we do believe we have made an impact in the research profile of the country in the area of humanities and social sciences. I was delighted to see statistics that come from the Department of Science and Innovation that since 2013, humanities and social sciences have begun growing in the productivity and the graduation of PhD students to now be the dominant area in the country. So I hope we have played some part in that. I will not take any, uh, any more of your time. I will please ask Professor Mosuetsa, the CEO of the Institute, to present our case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, CEO. Uh, CEO. She's muted, Chair. She's muted, yeah. She was here before. Uh, now she's no longer here. 
CEO, if you can hear us, just unmute yourself. No, she is unmuted. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm trying to uh, upload our slides. Share our slides. Okay. Someone else is sharing, uh, Chair. I can't, I can't share when other people are sharing. Okay, who's sharing uh, their document? Okay, try again, CEO. Will do, Chair. I still can't, can't share. There's, there's, there's someone else who's, who's, who's sharing in the background. Uh, it's a desktop share. Is it? Shamas, can you help us here? Can you note uh, a presentation on the screen? Okay, I'm going to see now, Chair. Shanaz, are you are you winning? Oh. <clears throat> Chair, there is this desktop windows that shows on your side. That yeah, th that is not allowing me to, to share my screen. And I think that's what Shinaz is also struggling with. And at this point, because I'm not the host, I can't, I don't have authorization to overrule that, that slide share. share. Okay. When you press on the icon share, there's a desktop, there's window, then there's PowerPoint. How do you get to that? You are not able to see. Honorable Chair, may, can I just uh, ask Sarah a question? Yes. Okay. Um, how many windows do you have open, uh, Sarah? Are there? It's just one window, and we tested this when we started yeah, this, and it was, oh, everything was fine. So I'm not, I'm is not the sure now. Not, uh, is it blocked out, or does it not show there? Okay, I'll show you what's, what's uh, see, it, it's not even... All right. So, Chair, maybe let me, let me suggest that I I I move out and hopefully it will it will stop the share. Um, Charles, are you also looking for the presentation? Okay, it looks like we are stuck now. <clears throat> um, and we do not have uh, enough time. Uh, are you winning, uh, CEO? Chair, we did all see the presentation. Can we not just look at it ourselves? Okay, maybe let's do that. Okay, CEO, just go ahead with your presentation. Uh, maybe let me just find out from members whether all of you have got uh, copies of the presentation. Chair, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm back. I think I'll be able to share now. Okay. Yeah, we can see it now. Go ahead. Apologies, honourable members. Let's let's start. My name is Sarah Mosweta. I'm the CEO of the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. I, I would like indeed to, to thank the committee for, the right for making this presentation. It has been five years in the making. I yes, will not... Struggling and now she's presenting. So, log in. 
Can I just ask Dr. Uh, Q to please mute himself so that we can do the presentation? Right. Thanks. Right. Dr. Dr. Chairperson, Chairperson, you are disrupting us. I mean, I will proceed, Chair. I'm, I'm okay. hoping there won't be any further interruptions. I will. I will take. We've, we've shared the, the the presentation, and and I will not uh, spend a lot of time with the background. I'll, I'll I'll I will focus more on what we've been able to do in a very short space of time is the NIHSS. I think at a glance, uh, I think this is always a useful slide to, to, to share with those individuals who are not familiar with, with our work. To date, we've graduated over 227 uh, uh, doctoral students in the humanities and social sciences, and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Mutseme, will also confirm that I think to date, this, this figure has also increased with the number of virtual um, present uh, graduations that have happened. We have also uh, awarded over 700 PhDs in, in the system, working very closely with the higher education sector. To date, we have also had over 300 outputs and, and contributing and, uh, positively towards the global research output. Uh, to date, uh, and this is, was our new mandate that we never anticipated we'll, we'll get in 2015, we've also had a number of engagements uh, around around our BRICS mandate, we are the customer of uh, the BRICS the BRICS academic forum uh, mandate, and therefore those engagements have been around that. As the chairperson has has noted, we've had uh, consecutive clean clean audits, and and the CFO can talk to that if there are questions. I think what pleases us the most in, in, in the five years is that uh, in the five years we are proud that we have made significant uh, contribution towards the broader uh, transformation mandate of, of the higher education system, but um, I think more needs to still be, be done. Uh, I don't want to belabor this, this point. I think uh, some of the board members are present in, in this meeting as well as our senior staff. Broadly, I want to just give a, a bit of context, given that we've never had this presentation before for this committee, talk about our, our, our the health of the organization as, as we stand now, and maybe talk about the three uh, programs, but particularly focusing on the scholarships and, the, and, and, and our, our graduates, given what we've been asked to do. In terms of context, we were indeed established in, in, in 2013 uh, under the Higher Education, Education Act. Uh, with a broad mandate of, of, of um, supporting, dynamizing the humanities and, 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 and social sciences, uh, linking up with the Global South, also linking up indeed very, very closely with, 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 the, with the continent. I think it is it, when, when, we, when we were uh, uh, established as, as, as an entity, we, we were under the impression that we were going to just focus on, on a number of, of, of key areas in, in, in South Africa. And indeed, in 2015, we were asked to um, also be the custodians of the BRICS, uh, the BRICS mandate, the academic, the academic forum. So we took that on, on, on board as well. Again, I, I wanted to show these, these two slides to, to, to give an impression in terms of what we are about and we supposed to highlighted two, three main, main ones. One, we were supposed to advance postgraduate uh, students through uh, uh, scholarships, through college innovations, two, to dynamize the fields of research. Uh, finally, as, as I was just saying just now, the BRICS mandate became a, 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 bigger, a bigger mandate for, for, for us. How do we do this? We do that through a number of programs that school is program being the biggest one, the catalytic research uh, program and project, the humanities hubs and, and the BRICS mandate. Our guiding principles has they've, they've always been around uh, equity, redress, making that we, we fund the big universities as well as the small universities from, from uh, Limpopo University to uh, the University of Western, Western Cape. 
again, in, in terms of our mission, we've always wanted to think about ourselves as enabling PhD scholarship in, 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 in South Africa, in the, in, in, in the continent, uh, as well as uh, making sure that the research that happens outside of just PhD scholarship is also funded, is also supported, and also playing in the uh, uh, policy space, BRICS space. We have not done this in the five, five I think five years uh, is a very short time, but in the five years we're very pleased that we've been, we've been in partnership with the universities through the South African Deans As Association that have, the, the, the deans have really been um, important in, 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 in making sure that we, we deliver on our mandate. And I think without their support, without working uh, with us with, through this collaboration, we would not have achieved what we've been able to, to achieve. As well as Codestry and in the continent, I think we're very proud that as, as, as a young entity, we've been able to leverage uh, a lot of cooperation and, and collaboration in, in the continent through Codestry. The other two partners that we've, we've collaborated with in the five years is the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, uh, as well as the India Council for Social Science uh, Research. Our funding, our funding. I think, I, again, I want I want to to emphasize this, uh, and and especially because in the previous slide I didn't mention anything about our other most strategic partners, DHEAD as well as NSF. NSF uh, funds most of our, our core programs, doctoral students, catalytic projects, and DHEAD has been funding us, uh, funding our op OPS budget, uh, including BRICS. Uh, this is part of just our history. I think the most uh, important founding document for us is the, uh, the Charter for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Again, com coming back to 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 some of the the highlights for for us in the in in the five years, it, it is it has been indeed the number of, of 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 projects that we've been able we've been able to 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 fund with uh, with and support with uh, strategic funding from from NSF. It has been a challenging uh, five five years funding, but funding wise, but also in terms of changing landscape in terms of higher higher education and training. I want to move on to this to this section and 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 maybe make this 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 point that even during the difficult times in terms of funding and changing landscape, I think the board of of, of uh, the NIHSS has has played a significant role in championing who who we are and how we navigate the different the different uh, 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 spaces and I think the, the the chairperson of audit and risk has, has guided us uh, significantly as well as the HR committee and, and Ms. Mr Melapo joins us in this in this in this meeting. Our internal values I think in a very short space of time chair we've also been able to set up systems and I I want I want to end this this part of the of the context by talking about funding, I think most people often assume that with 700 students that we've, 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 we've awarded funding to with 200 and, 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 and more PhDs and many other projects and the BRICS mandate, I think the, the assumption is always that we have more budget than we have. Uh, I wanted to show the slide to show that in 2019, 2020, which is the financial year that we've just concluded, our total budget, including OPS, was sitting at around uh, 127 million. This is slightly, you know, more than what what we started with in 2015-2016. Again, the chair mentioned the clean audits. I don't want to belabor the the, the point. Let me move straight ahead to us uh, and and talking about our academic program. In talking about our academic program, I think it is important to to talk about five five themes. In, in, in understanding how we've been able to leverage from our, the limited funding that we've had, but also from our strategic partners from DHET, NSF, to Codestria, ICSSR, and, 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 and Sahuda most, most especially. I think we've been able to respond to uh, uh, the societal problems that we've experienced as a country, as a continent in the global south. When our knowledge production, even with, with all of that, we've been able to contribute significantly towards the, the bigger vision of knowledge production from the South, from our perspective. 
and as well as 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 the big the big issues around transformation and for us transformation is not just around equity and we will show those numbers about equity it is also about generating new knowledge or new knowledge from our students to our catalytic project leaders and indeed uh, uh, again i want i want to emphasize the issue around global relevance not just uh, global for the sake of, of, of global and our, our BRICS program speaks speaks to this. Resources for, for policy makers, we've been able to make sure that as, as HSS we contribute directly towards, towards this. Let me talk about the first academic program of the three. This is the scholarships program uh, with three pillars that are focusing on our graduates, focusing on our mentorship program, and as well as how we do our doctoral program, which is the doctoral schools program. As I said, we've, we've funded over uh, 700, uh, we've awarded over 700 scholarships with different permutation. Uh, I think uh, sadly for us is, is that of, of those 700, there's been a few few students who've, who've, who've indeed dropped out. There's also a few students who un unfortunately passed away even when they, they, they went on the eve of their graduation. So that 700 uh, comprises of the, 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 the total. You will notice at, at the bottom of, of, of one of the, the, the bar graphs is that when we started 2014, 2015, we had 120, we were doing a, a gradual uh, intake of, 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 of students. That intake uh, uh, stopped in, in 2017. Of those that we funded, 71% of those are, are, are are black South Africans, um, and 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 58 percent of those are, are, are female. We, as I said, we work with all universities. You will find our PhD students from Walter Sisulu University to the University of KwaZulu Natal. Most people also assume that we just give funding and we leave our students to fend for themselves. What we are doing is as well in the institute is that. We support, fully support our students through um, doctoral, what we call regional doctoral uh, workshops or doctoral, doctoral schools, where we um, pair them with mentors, senior academics, to help them through the journey of, of PhDs. And I think that's why that will, that will also give reason to why we have higher throughput rates. Uh, we also um, encourage them to learn from each other. And I think our, our doctoral conferences uh, 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 speak to, 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 to that. I've just mentioned uh, a one initiative, which is the regional doctoral uh, uh, schools. One of the other supporting mechanisms that we, we, we provide for our students is the mentorship program, where we uh, appoint senior academics in the universities to work with a cohort of, of individuals, taking them through how to write a proposal to uh, a literature review to how to understand uh, your, your, your own uh, uh, data and, and uh, a lot of our writing workshops have been very successful for our students. I've mentioned our throughput and I want, I want uh, to focus particularly on uh, uh, this one. I think over time we've, we've seen that our, our, our students have, have indeed done well in terms of, in terms of graduation. Again, 70, uh, um, uh, what, what we're seeing is that most of our students are, 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 are graduating. Sorry, I've, I've brought in another slide here. Uh, what you see is that most of our, it's, it's, it's our female students who, who have a high number of, of, of graduation, which, which I think is, is, is an interesting uh, 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 phenomenon for us in, in the HSS when previous times or previous data has shown that it is um, our male counterparts who are graduating for, for, for us and our cohort. What we're seeing is that it's our female co uh, 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 counterparts who are indeed gra graduating. Uh, one of one of the one of one of the things that I think I think that the previous slide spoke to equity and and our our contribution towards uh, transformation. This slide speaks particularly to transformation 
uh, of knowledge production it, it, itself. And I think what we're, what we're proud of is that our students are producing knowledge that is mostly relevant, but also they are pushing the boundaries around what is knowledge and what is knowledge production. And what, what, what we are seeing is that some of our students are also uh, challenging old, old patterns of knowing and, and, and even, even, even writing. Uh, some of our students are, are, are writing their, their PhDs in Isizulu, Isikosa, which should be should be a, a, a step in, 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 in the right direction. There are also students who are asking bigger questions around their own disciplines. So a student a student who's, who's doing a PhD on decolonizing social social work curriculum. Other people have also asked us this 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 question, and I, I thought it would be important for us to bring to bring this the, the slide. Where are our students and, and how are they contributing back to higher education? I'm pleased that uh, to report that 16, 69% of our, our graduates, our alumni, are working in universities. So they are plowing back and they're they are making sure that they, they, they do what they need to do to change the, I think, I think the face of, of, of higher education in a positive way. They're not only doing that, they're not just occupying spaces in these universities, they're also producing. I think a majority of them are saying, after, after I've graduated, I've also published, which says a lot about knowledge production moving forward in, in HSS community. I want, I want to move on to just talk about, um, quickly talk about the other academic programs, which is the research, uh, the research program. And here there the are three pillars, the humanities hubs, catalytic research program as well as the, the work, work, working groups. Humanities hubs, you, you, you might ask, what are humanities hubs? Humanities hubs are heritage sites that we've identified that have played an, a significant role and are continuing to play a significant role in shaping South Africa's um, uh, past but also future. So we've identified a few of them and we've said uh, as a hub, as a humanities hub, how are you interacting with the university space, but also how are you interacting with the public? Are the HSS is not just in universities, it's also out, outside of those universities. And the, the heritage hubs have been able to leverage and be the bridge between university and, and, and the public or, or broader, broader society. They, they, they have a number of, of, of programs such as bringing basic, uh, break, break, bringing basic education in these in these spaces by bringing young young people and teaching them about history in a different way by not saying history is important but rather interact with lily's leaf you know what lily's leaf is uh, do, do you even know that there, there's such a space in the middle of rivonia that played a significant role in the history of 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 of, of south africa then the other the other example is 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 market theater um, as the institute we don't only support um, social sciences will also support the humanities and the market theater again given its history uh, was an important uh, for was an important collaborator for for for, for us catalytic research projects uh, Again, I'm, I'm responding to a question, why why do we call them catalytic? We call them catalytic research projects because they don't do just, what, what they do is not just uh, uh, produce research, which they're supposed to. Uh, and, and we ask them to do that and they, they've, they've done very well. If you look at the, the number of outputs that we've generated in a very short space of time, five years. But they're also catalytic because what we also ask of our projects is that they collaborate so it's not just one project leader in UKZN, it's also a project leader reaching out to other universities. But these projects are also about capacity building. So a number of, all of them are expected, we expect them to make sure that they, they, bring, in, they, they bring in masters and honors, honors students in the HSS community. What has been impressive, and I said this, what has been impressive is that with all of that that we've asked our project leaders to, to, to do, is that they've also been able to produce books, they've also been able to publish, and and for that I think the humanities and social sciences are in a better space today than they, they were uh, 20 years ago. Working groups, what are working groups? Working groups, unlike the research program, working groups, here yeah, we, are, we are supporting and funding uh, book publications, we are supporting conferences, we are supporting um, 
um, teaching uh, and networks and 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 and, collab and, and and collaboration. I think here our biggest um, one one of the examples that I want I want to share is is our our collaboration with HSRC Press, where they've they over a period of time funded and uh, we funded a particular a particular se series called the Liberations uh, Voices. Uh, 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 series and uh, with a number of publications that needed to see the light, the light of day. I want to, I want, I want to talk about uh, uh, HSS and and these projects and and maybe highlight maybe one one or two of of, of them. I think the, the 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 first one that I think come come to mind and I think it also speaks to why catalytic is is a project on decolonizing African pre pre-colonial historiography um, from the University of, 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 of UCT, uh, led by Professor Nzebeza, but also bringing in other other colleagues from, from, from the continent, from Mozambique particularly, but in other universities to think about uh, uh, pre-colonial history. Uh, before even 16, 1652. Um, and this project has produced two, two, two books and it has uh, made, made a significant impact in, in the landscape of, of higher education in, in terms of what we know and how we've always known our, 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 history, our history. I want, I want as, as part of the research program as well, we've also been uh, celebrating excellence in the in the humanities and social sciences, and I want to particularly pay pay tribute to our our five um, HSS annual annual uh, awards that we've we've, we've held uh, every year for five years, and 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 this is the, the the moment where we also showcase and celebrate those who've done extremely well and contributed towards knowledge production in the humanities and social sciences. I think one of the, the, the great things about these awards is that it's not just about books, it's also about celebrating the artists as, as, as well, those who do um, uh, the significant work that needs to be done in, in the arts field. This is the academic, uh, the, the one academic program, and uh, the, la the, the, the last one of, of, of the three is the international program. It, it in, in includes uh, the African Pathways program, and I'll talk about that just now, as well as the BRICS uh, program. And then international program, what what we do is 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 we support and fund uh, various projects, and that that seek to uh, that uh, collaboration between South Africans and and and, and uh, uh, some of our colleagues in in the continent, but also in the global south. So there's a big program currently with um, with our our India uh, Indian uh, uh, colleagues. They've come together and they've, they've worked on similar projects with, I think, uh, uh, great results. I also want to just talk about the African Pathways program, where we funded 22, uh, over 22 mobility, we've, we've awarded over 22 mobility grants. And these grants are really about exposing our students and some of our academics to the continent it, itself. We know that. Um, uh, at, at times, as, 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 as students and as academics, we only want to focus on South Africa without knowing what is in the in the continent. I think that grant uh, uh, seeks to explore our, our, uh, our help our students and our, our, our academics explore the, the continent and explore the continent as, as equals rather than anything anything else. Our biggest moment for the BRICS Think Tank was when we hosted the BRICS Think Tank in, in 2018. The way that we, we run the BRICS Think Tank and, and the BRICS Mandate is through research research clusters. Again, the research clusters are not just about one individual at the University of um, of Limpopo working alone. It's it's a collaboration. So the, the clusters involve a number. Each cluster involve, involves a number of, of academics. Uh, we fund them uh, to participate with our BRICS uh, our BRICS uh, counterpart. 
again, we, we are very proud that with, with the BRICS uh, mandate, we've also been able to publish a number of things, also to include a, a young, young, young scholars. And I think one, one of our um, highlight was when we hosted the, the BRICS youth in, in, in the building for the youth to also consider what BRICS means, means for them. In recent times, we've, 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 we've been talking about BRICS and, 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 and COVID, for example. Uh, we, I, I, I just want to, to conclude by, 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 by talking about the BRICS uh, Think Tank Council. I think the, the importance of the BRICS Think Tank Council at the moment chaired by um, Professor Spaman Lazondi is important in, 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 in driving a, a number of recommendations that come from the academic forum. And there's been two of them, and I don't want I don't want to waste more time, Chair. There's been two significant proposals. There's been many, but I think that I want to just uh, highlight two of them. The first one is the the new development bank that, as the academic forum, we we uh, recommended to to the summit, uh, which are the presidents, as well as the BRICS uh, vaccine center. It took a while for our presidents to to uh, to accept our proposals, and eventually, when they did, uh, they accepted. And um, we now know that we now have the new de uh, development bank, uh, the BRICS Vaccine Center. Uh, I think uh, these days, as, as the BRICS family, we talk about how the BRICS Vaccine Center was supposed to have been. Uh, established, I think, five years ago, and I think it would have contributed immensely in terms of the challenges that we are faced with currently as as as, as the world with, with, with COVID-19. I've said all of that, uh, Chair and Honourable Members, to show that in a very short space of time, I think there are early, early signs of progress in terms of this, this, this entity, in terms of our contribution towards the societal challenges, our knowledge production, our contribution towards transfor transformation, the transformation agenda of the higher education landscape, but also just the country at, at large. Our global reach and our global relevance and global here is not just the global south through BRICS, but global uh, uh, making sure that uh, uh, the continent is not left behind in, in ways that we are doing partnerships and funding. And finally, I think there needs to be an inter uh, interface between policymakers and the HSS community. I think we've, we've been able to do that in, in, in five years. Uh, Chair, I've also uh, shared a, a number of annexures for further information. I know that the presentation was, was short. I would have loved to, to, to say more, but I've shared uh, various uh, annexures. And with that, I want, I want to thank you and, and honorable members for this opportunity. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you very much, CEO and the Chair of the Board. Um, I'd like to thank you and appreciate the presentation. Um, I think uh, the two elders are doing quite a marvelous job. Uh, from where I'm seated, uh, I was quite impressed by the presentations. Uh, from the NRFs up to the last presentation. Uh, I'm going to take hands from members to engage with the two presentation. Uh, I see Professor Bozoni. Uh, who else would like to engage? Uh, let's see, Honorable Mukacho. Yeah, I only have those four for now. Okay, let's start with the uh, Honorable Pozzoli. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, presenters, for some great presentations. Um, <clears throat> just to start with the Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences, you know, um, you really seem to have got the point that, that funding humanities research is very different from funding science research. And I have to say that much as I love the NRF, it's something that the NRF has never quite got its head around, um, that 
stimulating and growing humanities is a very different matter from the sciences. And um, I, I do think that you seem to have, have, have done well on that. But I do think, on the other hand, that there's a lot that the NRF knows that the Humanities Institute should think about learning from. Um, you know, like their chairs program, their centers of excellence program, their outreach. Um, I'm sure you'll say you don't have enough money for that, but I'll talk about that just now. But perhaps setting up some sort of formal liaison with the NRF so that you can learn from one another would be um, a constructive idea. Can I ask some questions now? The first one is, what is the value of the scholarships that you give to the PhD students? Um, I'm interested particularly if it's more or less than those offered by the NRF because I sense that even though you think 120 million isn't a lot, the whole amount that the NRF has for all disciplines for doctorates is only 313 million. Um, so actually by comparison with the NRF you are very well funded and this is something of an anomaly. The problem lies with the NRF funding, not with yourselves. The NRF is grossly underfunded. And I think this should be a message to the, the NRF and uh, the DS, DSI and to, of course, Treasury, um, that this kind of low level of funding can't be sustained. Anyway, back to the Institute of Humanities. Um, could you tell us what proportion of your budget does go to the PhDs? Um, because we don't, uh, and in fact, what amount annually goes to the PhDs? Are the PhDs that you fund already on the staff of universities, or are they all full-time students who then move on to the staff? I was just looking at your statistics on staff. Do you fund pure blue skies research? Pure philosophy, pure history, pure music, not linked to any of your themes? And do you fund what the NRF calls established researchers? I don't see any funding for that. You seem to mainly fund students and then um, these uh, workshops and get together and prizes. Um, now, that's not unimportant. It's an important part of humanities funding, is conferences, workshops, etc. But an even more important part of strengthening humanities in the country, presumably, is funding established researchers, the ones who actually lead um, the research um, program nationally and who can provide the, the home into which the new younger researchers then embed themselves. And then my last point is I was wondering if you could send us a copy of the review when it's done, because it sounds interesting that um, you are being reviewed and obviously very, very important. Just to turn to the NRF, it's really staggering, especially when compared to the NIHSS, how little funding you have for students um, and how, how deprived the NRF is when compared with the Department of Higher Education. Um, all undergraduate, I mean, hundreds of thousands of undergraduate students are now funded, hundreds of thousands. But as far as postgraduates are concerned, we only have 12,000 supported. Um, so no wonder we aren't producing postgraduates in the sort of numbers we should be producing them. And the amounts that they get do not support them fully. So um, it just brings to, to, to our attention once again how badly funded the NRF and the NSI both are. And then the same question to you, how much does each student get compared to um, a NISFAS student and then compared to an NIHSS student? Um, and I just wanted to make a comment that the work that the NRF does um, really keeps South Africa able to punch above its weight in research. However small the budget and however small the number of people the NRF can support, it somehow or other manages to keep our research system punching above its weight in world terms. 
So when you look at the rankings of world universities, which are all based on research primarily, our universities do extremely well um, by comparison with the size of our, our, um, our, our national budget. So we're, we're a country that does extremely well in research on very little money. And once again, that, that simply reinforces the argument that this is an institution which needs more money. And I really think that's something we need to record extremely strongly as a result of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Ozzoli. Honorable uh, Kasha. Um, good afternoon, Chair. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to um, everyone in the meeting, and thank you very much for all the presentations that have been made. Chair, I'd like to speak um, particularly to the NH, um, uh, NIHSS. Um, well, firstly, I mean, I, I don't know if they've uh, done any work when it comes to the call that was made by students in the year 2015 um, in terms of decolonizing the, the curriculum, or not, besides the curriculum, decolonizing the entire education, um, se uh, higher education sector, and, and what that means in the context of South Africa. What does decolonization look like? Others have referred to Africanization. Um, I mean, there have been various um, sort of... Um, uh, perspectives that have been put forth, but ultimately, I think what everyone is trying to say is that, um, you know, what we need, to put, we, we need to put an effort into creating an education system that resonates with the, the demands and needs of the South African context. So um, I don't know if they've done any work with regards to that. Um, and, and I mean, one would like to suggest, um, you know, <clears throat> to the department and um, to some of its entities on really embarking on this particular process um, so that um, we don't find ourselves, uh, you know, in a few years' time having similar protests of this nature where, you know, um, there's constant questioning of the type of education that is being um, presented to to young people in the country. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so that would be any work they've done with this regard. Um, and then, Chair, you know, with the increase of prioritization and attention that has been given to science, technology, um, and, and engineering, um, and the valuing of it with a, uh, an almost um, a, a nuance, with, al with almost having a nuance of saying that, you know, the social sciences aren't as, as pivotal as the sciences are. Um, or the hardcore physical sciences are, um, what work is being done in that sense? Um, you know, the conversations around um, the fourth industrial revolution, um, what work is being done by, by um, the NH, am I saying it right? NIHSS, sorry, NIHSS. Well, what work is being done um, with that regards to, 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 you know, sort of locate, um, there is, locate the identity of the social sciences within a society that is really prioritizing the sci um, sciences uh, uh, and technology and engineering. And then today, um, on slide two of the presentation, it states that 700 students were awarded scholarships and 277 PhD students um, graduated. Um, is there any indication of where the 423 um, remaining students are, where they find themselves? Um, how many are still in the system and how many have dropped out? Um, what is the average number of years a, a PhD students take to complete their studies? Um, is it three or is it usually more than that? And of the 277 graduates, um, how many are in, in academia that would be the PhD graduates? Um, does the NIHSS have um, collaboration with the HSRC and the NRF? And if so, Chair, um, can can you know uh, can it be shared as to what kind of work are they doing together? Um, so, Chair, yeah, that, that's about it from my side. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable Mukacho. Uh, Honorable Gates. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Uh, I'm just going to be very, very brief because uh, 
Okay. And maybe to check with other members because I was I've been trying to check the attachments of the two presentations that we're dealing with from my emails and it looks like the attachment I was sent it does not want to open and I do not know whether it's my own device or it's a systematic problem but yeah back to the presentations two of them I think let's take time to welcome them and uh, just as I said very brief with regard to the NRF, right? And this is one of the submissions we always make with regard to, you know, institutions that are charged with the responsibility of producing some, you know, knowledge, so to say, right? And, you know, one wonders that for an argument sake, let's say we, yes, we are funding postgraduate students. It's okay. We, after how long are we going to so, so so i'm not trying to enter into the the missions and the visions of the entity itself but i'm trying to uh, understand facts that do we fund students and after they graduate we leave it there right we, we, we wasted money they've accumulated knowledge whether they're employed anywhere or we don't care as long as we have funded them we leave it there I think that is a very problematic approach, uh, especially in a country like South Africa, where it's uh, in a process of developing, where we need a lot of, you know, in intellectual property to be, uh, you know, taken serious. And the research capacity, I mean, I'm listening to Honorable Mkachwa uh, putting across the point of the decolonized education that we were fighting for in 2015 and even today we are still fighting i mean very few people understand what is it that we are talking about when we speak about colonized decolonized uh, education i mean i think uh, the, the the research foundation is one of its uh, responsibilities to try and find ways on how they can bring public into confidence that the kind of education we are getting is not the one that will ultimately assist South Africa to get out of these economic uh, issues that we are currently facing. So the, the question that I'm trying to raise here, or the concern, is leaving or abandoning, or rather, you know, just not giving any, I don't know how to put it, but not taking care of the output, right, or the throughput that you produce from this university. I can tell you there are a lot of uh, bright minds that you are funding, but unfortunately, they are not. There are no proper platforms, uh, you know, to or even employers, so to say, because when you you are much brighter, way way brighter, it's only the big corporations that are going to bid for your services and as a result government is not going to benefit in that process we have a lot of professors who are, who are very bright very bright that nrf produces every year and you know this all these big multinational corporation they absorb these people our own talent the talent that was supposed to be helping our people so this is one thing that i thought i should raise with the nrf and uh, the last part that I want to raise with the NRF2 is with regard to the indigenous uh, knowledge system and maybe how are they, you know, their involvement in the entire, you know, scope of dealing with the indigenous knowledge system. I, I know we had a, an engagement with the department last year, last year or early this year in parliament uh, with regard to this issue of indigenous knowledge system. And I'm of the view too that it's not well understood in a, you know, broader perspective if s1 would uh, put it that way you know it's it's so when when one speak about the the remedy so so to say of madagascar and how it gets involved in the indigenous knowledge system what is it that the role that the nrf is playing uh, to ensure that uh, those kind of issues like the one of the remedy in madagascar is uh, you know uh, taken into cognizance. I think I will leave it there with regard to, well, with regard, I think some of the, I, I know in this meeting we have professors in the process and countries like your Switzerland, I think there's a, for every postgraduate, I mean, a PhD graduate, 
if they are not employed, there is a compulsory grant they get every month. So, so they give them that uh, grant to continue doing research and you know enhancing their thinking capacity, right? So, I want to check what is it that we can do in South Africa to motivate people to pursue the doctorate studies to go and study PhD and, 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 and so forth. I mean, you can all agree with me that as it stands currently, majority of South Africans are not uh, pursuing PhD studies. You go to universities in South Africa today, majority of these PhD students are, uh, are our African brothers and sisters who are coming outside the country. And, you know, all others that are coming outside the African continent. So that is a big concern, and I think you'll agree with me. There is a lot of them uh, that are not South Africans that are doing PhD. So I think that should also need to be clarified in that regard. I think I'll leave it there, Chairperson. That is, those are the only issues that I thought I should uh, raise with the committee. Okay, thank you very much, Lord Gates. Uh, can we get Honorable Bosho, Master? Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairs and uh, Honorable Members and uh, all the highly trained minds from the different institutions. Uh, I really appreciate uh, both of these uh, presentations. Uh, I have two things that I, uh, I was wondering about and that I hope maybe um, we could get some clarity on. The one is um, how optimistic are the different institutions or institutes, uh, foundation and institute to be exact, uh, that with a, an economy which will shrink by maybe 10% in this year and uh, a huge growth in health and social um, demands uh, as a direct result of that, that the funding, although uh, not sufficient will be maintained because uh, it's always a problem, especially with the um, with the with the sciences without the direct um, uh, impact, uh, a measurable, countable um, uh, impact. That it is said, well, how many houses could you have built, or how many hungry people could you have fed, and when they are actually not um, famine then it is uh, easier to, to um, you know, to, to convince people to spend the money. I'm a little bit concerned about uh, this. I'm a, a trained in the social or actually in the humanities myself. I, I, I think it's very important, uh, but I, I often, uh, you know, encounter the problem that people don't really agree. Uh, even that people uh, regard the humanities as not really sci sciences. And then I just want to ask another question about the Institute. Uh, when the National Research Fund ended the uh, presentation, there were all the logos of the different um, entities with whom they are associated. And, and it's a wide variety. And we could see in the, in the NRF's um, uh, presentation uh, the, the, the very wide spectrum of activities that are um, involved with. What I would like to know is if we have the NRF and we have the HSRC, uh, do we need the uh, Institute for Human and Social Sciences as a separate uh, entity? What is the, uh, the motivation uh, for its separate existence as an institute, could these uh, same functions maybe have been included within other existing institutions? Um, I'm actually not asking it because I want to express an opinion. I really want to know uh, what's the answer to the question. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, Dr. Boshoff, um, I don't have much from my side. In fact, I was quite uh, convinced by the presentations and the good work that has been done. Uh, except to note what Professor Pozzoli raised, the issue of funding of the NRF. Uh, I think it remains a concern given the fact that currently there is a 
sort of a directive from National Treasury that about 20% of uh, departmental budgets must be cut. Uh, and that is also going to have some impact on the work that the National Research Foundation is doing. Uh, I think uh, we, working with the department, uh, should be in a position to uh, motivate for the additional funding for the National Research Foundation. In actual fact, for the entire Department of Science and Innovation and all its entities, because we know that it is the least funded, this department, and yet it is doing the most fantastic job. So I think uh, just to uh, buttress the point that has been raised, but generally I'm quite happy with uh, the presentations. Uh, if we can just uh, hand over to, we start with the NRF and uh, the, the Institute will follow. Uh, Chairperson, uh, thank you very much. And thank you to the honorable members for uh, the questions that have been Posed and uh, for the time that you spend listening to uh, our presentation. Uh, Chairperson, with your permission, um, we, we always work as a team, and uh, um, I've requested my colleague, uh, Dr. Petua Matutu, to respond to the Honorable Bazzoli, uh, particularly around uh, the current bursary values, the average current bursary values, and how that is going to change uh, next year. Um, and, and secondly, um, I've requested uh, her to also respond to the Honorable Ketze um, with regard to how we support uh, those students who have graduated and wish to continue uh, undertaking research, uh, as she did indicate that we have a pipeline uh, approach to the work that we do. Uh, and then lastly, my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Beverly Demans, will talk to uh, the pertinent issues that um, um, the Honourable Boshoff has raised, uh, particularly with respect to um, how we see what is currently happening to the sustainability of the system that we support uh, in the immediate future. So with that, Chairperson, can I hand over to my colleague, Dr. Matutu? Thank you, Chair. Okay, Dr. Matutu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, starting with uh, yeah. Professor Bozzoli's question, which was on um, our average funding for postgraduate students. Um, currently, we are funding at honours level, at the level of about uh, 60,000, and at master's level, at the level of 90,000, and at PhD level, at the level of 120,000. And that is going to um, uh, change because we have introduced a postgraduate policy, which is trying to um, change the demographics, as I pointed out, that the honor students, the representation there doesn't translate to the level of PhDs. So our intention is to ensure that we add uh, the class um, uh, dynamics to the issues of race and uh, gender. So what that is saying is that we're going to be supporting uh, students at two levels. One would be the partial funding for students who are excelling in their work, who need support from the NRF and encouragement that we need to retain within the system. However, those students who are performing well and at the same time are financially needy have to be fully supported. So that will mean that we will provide the full support for those students. We have costed this. It would mean a reduction in the number of the students that we fund. And we have been negotiating with the ESFAP uh, that they uh, assist us with the wraparound support that um, they have started introducing for students, which goes beyond just the issue of um, uh, survival, survival and management, uh, managing within the system 
to uh, the stage where a student is relatively comfortable with proceeding to masters and supported fully financially with proceeding to PhD. So we're working with uh, ISAP in that regard. The numbers are still low uh, that we are partnering with ISAP on about 500, whereas overall we support about 12,000 students per annum. So um, we are in the process of changing in terms of the values of the student to accommodate largely the financially needy students so that we can add the class dynamic to a representative the representativity uh, then uh, uh, can i move on to uh, honorable kids's question or can i wait until other people address the the, okay. the uh, honorable question Kasho? Dr. Matuti, just address the part that was meant for you. Okay. And then we will go to the next. Person. Okay, no, that's fine. Uh, moving on to uh, Honorable uh, Ketz's uh, question on the indigenous knowledge system, it has got a number of um, facets which are students, uh, human capital development, the curriculum development, and so on. And uh, it goes on to basic research, applied research, and um, innovations. The National Research Foundation's mandate, it focuses largely on the human capacity development component, which is at um, postgraduate level and a researcher grant uh, support. However, when it comes to the innovation, you'll recall that the innovation fund was moved from the NRF to the Technology Innovation Agency, which is supposed to be dealing with all issues of commercialization. So we support the indigenous knowledge when it comes to uh, knowledge systems, when it comes to all the areas which are within our mandate. So there was a grant at some stage which was put together in the priority areas or the science missions that I mentioned were priorities of government. However, they can apply in all our other funding as chairs and together as um, early career researchers, as postgraduate students. And on the issue of, of absorption of uh, PhD, uh, PhDs into our system, as I mentioned, as soon as a PhD um, graduates, we do provide postdoctoral support. And depending on the competitiveness, students will apply and be able to, uh, sorry, fellows will apply. Uh, stop. We are missing you now. Okay. Mr. Chair. I think yeah. she might have muted herself or there is something wrong with the connection. I think there is something wrong with the connection, Chairperson. Let me finish off um, what she was going to say with your permission. Okay, I'll go ahead. Uh, no, Chair, as she was indicating, uh, what we do post PhD is to support. Um, postdoctoral uh, fellowships. Um, at the moment, all of them are in country. We would love to be able to take our postdocs um, to get exposure for, in terms of international exposure. And, and that's where the partnerships that we are brokering uh, is hopefully going to yield far better fruits than it has before. And then postdoc, uh, you enter into the Early Career Researcher Program, uh, where you see, um, uh, the BAP program, or for that matter, any other initiative where we support uh, an early career, and then obviously you mature uh, beyond early career into an established uh, uh, career. So we have a pipeline to be able to encourage those that want to uh, continue to pursue the knowledge agenda. Chairperson, if I may pass on to um, uh, Dr. Beverly Bermonds, um, with regard to the questions of Honorable Boshoff, is just to indicate to Honorable Bazzoli that um, the change uh, in terms of our funding policy will kick in in 2021, the 2021 academic year. 
And so partial cost of study will cover tuition fees and accommodation, uh, while total cost of study will accommodate uh, everything, including the necessary uh, support uh, structures and instruments. And, and if I may then just uh, pass on to, uh, to Dr. Demons. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Malapo. Um, Honorable Boshoff, um, your question about how optimistic we are about the economic shrinkage and the competing demands on the national fiscus is a is a key one at this stage because funding has been the the theme throughout many of these questions that we have. But also, I think uh, the chair. Honorable Chairperson also provided some important background to that, knowing that departments have been asked to uh, take a 20% budget cut. Uh, at the moment, in our understanding, it looks like it's not finalized yet. This would result in a 96 million cut on our baseline, but a 760 million total uh, budget cut for the NRF, that means baseline and contract. So we can see in the immediate short term that this must affect a system which relies heavily, uh, as Honorable Bazzoli said, uh, to keep the system uh, functioning at the level that it needs to function um, to keep us competitive. So a cut at that level is definitely going to have some um, sizable effect on the system. And we are trying through a number of principles to look at um, how we mitigate where we can, because it's, it's hard to mitigate totally against a 760 uh, million uh, budget adjustment or cut, as it were. So um, we are really trying to protect student bursaries that have been awarded as far as possible because they are most vulnerable um, at this stage. Um, but also look at to what extent we can mitigate um, these kinds of cuts uh, in the next lot of the pipeline, which then gives you the early career and the established researchers. And we have been keeping in constant communication with the higher education system to, to really look around. But there are going to be areas that are going to uh, face uh, some kind of cut on this uh, internally, we're looking at how also to manage costs down in terms of just running the organization, the freezing of posts, etc. So it's, it's managing both um, how to keep the research going, but also how to make sure that internally our costs are also lowered in order for us to save as much as possible back into the system. So um, we're about as optimistic as we can be with those numbers put before you at this stage. Okay, uh, are we done with the, with the NRF? Uh, Chair, if I can quickly add. Okay. Uh, yes, Chairperson, thank you. I would like to just express my support, uh, particularly to your earlier statement about the importance of the, from a funding perspective for the DSI. Uh, I'd like to especially address the aspect of the I in the DSI of innovation. Uh, as Honorable Kietze said that, you know, sometimes the students graduate uh, and then they're looking for jobs. And I think that the review that is taking place across the entities of the department, both higher education uh, as well as science and innovation, I think that review, uh, Chairperson, is likely to create a, an angle uh, that says that, you know, students today and graduates today uh, don't simply have to rely on others for employment, that the research and technology transfer aspect can in fact uh, bring uh, about new opportunities. Uh, and uh, Chair, you know, the aspect of innovation, particularly, uh, you may remember that when we had the drought uh, some years ago, it was South Africa and its innovation that had planted uh, drought resistant seeds. So I think that aspect uh, is, is really key. Um, and, the, and the white paper on science, technology and innovation that is proposing and calling for that uh, increase uh, in R&D spend uh, for from the G for, as a percentage of one point towards 1.5 percent uh, over the decade. Uh, I think will be something that if we expedite on, uh, it would be something that we would reap benefit of. 
so Chairperson, just those remarks uh, from a system perspective uh, and that the review that is taking place uh, and how that review could in fact uh, assist us for increasing the R&D uh, and RDI component of the budget. Thank you, Chairperson. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can we move uh, to uh, the Institute? Thanks, thanks, Jake. Can I please ask um, 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 Professor Sitas, you wanted to add something? No, no. Put in your hands. Uh, uh, may, maybe for, for, the, for the first two questions, uh, Chair, can I just ask our, our CFO to respond to the funding question and, and our Director Academic to speak on uh, our, our students and the type of knowledges that they've been able to, to produce briefly. Thanks. Okay, that's fine. I see yeah, a hand. Well, let's start with okay, I see a hand from somebody. If you can just lower your hand. Uh, I don't know who's raising his hand. Oh, yeah, no, it's fine. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, uh, CFO? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to the, the question on the funding, um, in terms of our total budget, um, around 44.6% um, would, would go to scholarships. Um, and in terms of, there's also a question around the value of uh, PhD um, scholarships. So from the NHSS um, per scholarship, the amount would be 132 thousand um which which is almost aligned to 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 the nsf's um phd um uh, scholarship amount thank you chair and Tarabi, can you dr Mutem, can you please come in Okay, who's supposed to come in? Chair, uh, Dr. Mutem, and she's not connecting, maybe. Hello. Dr. Mutem, we can see you. Go ahead and tap. Go. It looks like there's a problem okay. with the connectivity there. Can you try again, man? Okay, and Tabi, I think there's a, there's a connection. There's a, there's there's a lag. Can I can I proceed? I think we are working with 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 time. Can I just proceed? Is that okay? That's absolutely fine. Chair, there seems right. to be a connection Tabi? issue with Dr. Mutemme. Okay, no, it's fine. Uh, Dr. Mutemme is experiencing connectivity problem. Uh, just take your questions, uh, CEO. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, Chair, I think uh, safe to say that indeed 44% of our budget goes to, to our students as direct payments uh, to, to universities. However, I think our, our total expenditure for, 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 for our students is, is, is about 55% of our budget. As I indicated, we have a mentorship uh, program and other initiatives to support our, our students. So when you look at total expenditure for students, I think you need to take that into consideration. Um, I, more, uh, most of our students, and as per our call, are full-time full -time students. Yes, we have permutations with some of our students, also taking up uh, 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 some, some positions or part-time work. That is to be expected given that 132,000 rands for a senior individual who's taking care of a family, 132,000 admittedly is, is still a low, a, a low uh, a figure for, 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 such, for such students. They are, uh, they are not full-time, uh, majority of them are not full-time uh, staff members. They're not supposed to be full-time staff members. But those those are sometimes incidents that, that, that creep in, in, in the system. And 
a PhD is linked to what the individual is doing. So, for example, we have a student who's working in a museum, and their PhD is in 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 in, in that in that space. So that's that's always a, 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 a allowed. I think for for us, it's a lot of we need to to build in a lot of flexibility for the humanities and social science uh, 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 students. The 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 other the other issues. Uh, if, if, if you notice from, from the presentation, yes, most of our funding goes to students, but we have established researchers. That is why we, uh, we were talking particularly around the BRICS program, as well as the catalytic projects. And those catalytic projects are led by senior academics uh, in, 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 the, in, in, in the system. And as I, I, I think I mentioned, one of them being, being a Professor Luis Silen Zeveza at, at, at UCT, and there, 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 there are many others, as I said, Chair, I think, uh, if if we had uh, more time, I would have I would have talked about all of those those researchers who are leading these catalytic uh, research projects. I think it's it's, it's almost the same uh, model as 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 the chairs that have been implemented uh, uh, else, elsewhere. I want to just touch a, a bit, and I think Tamsin wanted to Dr. Mzeme wanted to also talk to this. Uh, decolonizing uh, a knowledge is 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 not once off, and I think the the the. Um, the, the the discussions then and as as I I, I re recall honourable members and correct me if, if I'm wrong I think there's always when when this this issue around decolonizing uh, the uh, knowledge in, in in higher education was raised most people kept on saying where are we going to find this knowledge uh, so that we decolonize our curriculum in, in universities and what our role has been in in in, in the institute is to produce that knowledge so that the naysayers and the critics do not have anywhere else to hide because we are then able to say, but we've produced this book in collaboration with HSRC. We've produced this book in collaboration with Vet Press, with Jakana. So that has been our contribution. It will be a slow process given a, a number of, 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 of challenges, uh, a system sometimes needing needing to be nudged further to, 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 to change. But it is, it is a project that I think all of us need to engage with systematically. We, we, we are doing our, our, our part. Uh, our, some of our students, we are encouraging them to convert their PhDs. Not all PhDs are books, but we are encouraging some of them to, to, to publish their, their, their theses as, as books. I think there's one uh, one that I can cite now will be published by Vets Press, a story about Ken Temba. There has never been a story about, 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 about Ken Temba written by us in from a uh, based based here so that's those those are i think uh, some of the examples in which in where we are we are indeed contributing towards that vision that we we, we share in, in 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 the institute around decolonizing the knowledge project our curriculum and and indeed our our, our our spaces i also want to add that our catalytic projects have also been contributing towards that in 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 the languages projects that we've we, we, we've been funded and uh, led by professor Ma, Ma, Ma and many other such 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 um, projects. I agree, uh, uh, honourable member, that the fourth industrial revolution is not a natural science question. It, it is also a, a, an HSS uh, a question, and or HSS should also be part of that of those discussions and part of shaping that discourse. Uh, as but but as equals, not as 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 as, as add-ons. And we've done our our part here, and I'm, I'm I'll be happy to to share with you some of our our small uh, initiatives towards towards that but i think they are also significant uh, uh, con uh, contribution that we've made for 400 uh, um, 700 students sorry 400 700 students i can give you the permi permutations now uh, of, of of this 700 plus seven have been cancellations students saying i don't want to pursue a phd anymore therefore more than 700 have been dropouts. Dropouts have been an unfortunate honorable member because most of those have been due to, to ill health. There's, there's a, there, there, there are a few students who've, who've struggled with mental illness, for example, and I'm not uh, 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 saying more, more than that, but at, uh, you know, a PhD journey is, is, is often difficult when you come from a particular background and uh, when, when we see those numbers, we are always concerned. But again, I think 
uh, 17 in, 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 in a bigger bigger pool of 700 is, is, is still very low. There has been a number of non-takers, non so we've awarded and they've said no, they want to take another scholarship uh, elsewhere. And I think we need, we need to, to declare those because at some point we, we also counted them. The most, the most hard, hard, heartbreaking of them all is that we've, we've had three of our graduates. They've already graduated who passed on one violently gender-based violence. And, you know, I think, I think those are the things that we also, the societal problems also come to the Institute and we have to grapple with them in, in those ways. There's also been 11, 11 conditional uh, uh, cancellations. And these conditional cancellations are, we funded you for a one year or two years, but you want to move and, and study abroad for three years. So we, we, we put your scholarship in abeyance. If you graduate, you still need to acknowledge us Indeed, the taxpayer has 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 paid has paid for part of your PhD. So those are the conditional uh, uh, cancellations, and I'm hoping that uh, clarifies the 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 the, the seven hundred. Indeed, there are two hundred who've, 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 who've more than two hundred now, close to three hundred who've graduated. There's a further three hundred plus that are in this. and those what what gives us great joy is that the majority of that three hundred. Uh, they are already writing. They are already writing. They are already thinking. I'm submitting next month. I'm submitting in two in two months' time, and that I think is 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 um, uh, great news for coming from us in terms of where we where we invested uh, resources, taxpayers' money there. On average, it takes about four years for a, a PhD, sometimes even longer. And I think for the entity, we've always for the institute, we've always said. Uh, on average, an, an HSS PhD anyway, sometimes even takes 10 years. So I think our limited funding has also pushed our students to say, let's, let's focus, we'll give you all the support, let's, let's uh, deliver in, 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 in four years. Let, let me talk about collaboration with other entities. We've collaborated very successfully with HSRC. HSRC is a different entity, and you, I'm, I'm, I'm sure honorable members uh, know it's different from, from, from NIHSS. It does not uh, give funding. It, it uh, collects funding. So we've been funding a number of academics, especially in the BRICS space, because BRICS is not just the institute or one university, it's everyone. So we've funded a number of academics at the HSRC. As I said, one of our flagship projects with HSRC has been the HSRC Press, and that has gone uh, remarkable, remarkably well, and uh, we are very proud of that collaboration. We're also very proud that we've been able to work very closely with, 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 with HSRC. Let me, let me just raise one, one last issue, and I, I, I might not have covered everything. Am I? See you all. Deliberate in making the argument, in the, the point right. that uh, over time, in, even in the very short space of time, five years, we've had a number of, of, of budget cuts and we've been able to, uh, so to say, weather the, 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 the storms. And, and this, the, the, current, the current storm is one of, one of those. It will be unfortunate though, honorable member, if uh, we as a HSS um, take on the bulk of the impact of the, uh, uh, the, the economy, that this, this burden is not, should, uh, is not equally shared with the, the natural the natural sciences. So I, I think that 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 that's an important thing for 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 us. That as 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 a country, we took a step at at some point uh, uh, ten years ago that the humanities and social sciences matter, um, not just symbolically, but they need to be to be funded through a dedicated uh, uh, entity. And this is the entity. And I think in five years we have shown how a deliberate focus on the HSS what it can indeed uh, produce not only for uh, 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 PhDs and, and, and R&D, but particularly to, to the big political questions that honorable members are raising around innovation, not just innovation for its, for its own sake, but also uh, the, the, the big issue around decolonizing our, our curriculum knowledge system and, 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 transforming, and, and transforming our, 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 our country and taking it forward. Thanks, honorable members. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, the chair is, doesn't want to comment. He says we're in, in your good hands.
But otherwise, thank you very much, uh, all of the presenters uh, and uh, all the staff members from the two entities, together with the boards, for honoring our invitation. Uh, basically, the intention was just to uh, to get a sense of the work that you are doing uh, in supporting research, uh, in funding uh, postgraduate students, and and so forth. And I think that uh, we've been able to succeed uh, in that uh, task. And I think members are now much more uh, empowered uh, in what you are doing. It's always a pleasure to interact with the entities in the DSI. Uh, unlike other entities where the interaction becomes much more adversarial. Uh, but when we interact with the entities from DSI, it's much more cordial sharing of knowledge mm -hmm. and so forth, which demonstrates that uh, things, at least at that level of government, are going very well. It may not be everything going well, but in the overall, I think we are satisfied with the kind of work that you are doing uh, and keep it up. I think uh, this therefore brings us to the end of uh, this meeting. Uh, and uh, members will be advised about um, or oh, what's happening? Members will be advised by uh, will be advised as to when are we meeting again. We are supposed to engage with the minister next Tuesday, uh, the ninth, I think, and that has been confirmed. So uh, we will meet again, honourable members. Next week, if there is nothing this week. Yeah, no, there's nothing for this week. Okay, thank you very much. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.